right, you guys, let's pick it up. Uh, go back to the lecture. Here we go. Before we move forward, um, I want to just kind of recap these six examples. So when we first learned about limits, you know, kind of the idea of the limit is one thing like, okay, what are we approaching? And like graphically, that's fine. But when we start seeing examples where we don't have a graph, right? And we kind of see how limits are done in different situations, um, you know, it can, it can be confusing or it can be um, a lot to take in. Like, well, in this case, here's what the approach would be. But in this other case, use a totally different approach. Let's kind of look back at these six and see some similarities and differences, kind of take a bigger picture. So in part A, uh, part A and part B were very similar. We noticed, hey, there's nothing unusual happening where X is approaching in part A, so we could just plug it in. Same thing with part B, even though we're dividing by X minus three, if we're approaching zero, no problem. Plug it in, get our answer for both of those. Things started to get a lot trickier and we started having to use you know, more advanced techniques and just plugging in, in things like C and D and E. Those were all had kind of a similar property to them. So we notice in three, oh, if I plug in at zero over zero, same thing with D, same thing with E, same thing with F as well. How did we go about C? We said, okay, well, if I get zero over zero, then that means I need to simplify. Well, to simplify here means to factor, factor and cancel. Same thing for D, factor and cancel. In E, simplifying, although that's still the, the process forward, simplifying there meant multiplying the top and the bottom by the conjugate of that numerator. We're still simplifying. And in the end, we're still gonna cancel out the X minus three, the two factors, um, but it wasn't as straightforward as factor and then cancel. It was multiplied by the conjugate, but still kind of notice that similarity of, okay, simplify and then, um, and then cancel the factor that needs to be canceled and then plug in. <clears throat> Finally, for F, we realized, okay, hey, zero over zero, but, in this case, we, there was no way to simplify. Uh, we, there's no factoring to, to do, or there's no conjugate or anything like that. So we go to our last resort, which we really don't wanna have to do this, but you know, if, if there is no, no other way possible, then we create a table of values. When it comes to a quiz or an exam, um, if there's a situation that needs a table of values, I'm gonna say that in the question. I'm gonna say, use a table of values to approach this one um, or to answer this one. You know, in the other questions, it, it might be like, you know, use algebraic techniques to simplify or, do, you know, do whatever you need to do. So there would be a little bit different directions telling you, hey, we need a table here. So you wouldn't, you won't ever have to guess. Okay, great. Um, hopefully that clears things up a little bit everything like, okay, limits are great, but like all these techniques, let's move ahead and see something even different. Now we have a piecewise function. F of X equals X plus one when X is less than two. And F of X equals the square root of X plus two if X is greater than or equal to two. Hopefully you are familiar with piecewise functions um, they definitely obviously come up in pre-calc and so on, um, right? All we're saying is, hey, for X values less than two, use this. For X values greater than or equal to two, use that. Um, we're gonna check out the graph of this thing here after we've gone through a couple of limit questions and kind of we'll even see, I'll show you guys how to graph piecewise functions in Desmos. It's pretty nifty. Okay, part A. The limit of this function as X approaches to from the left, notice we've got a one-sided limit. Piecewise functions and one-sided limits go really well. We often see those together. Um, piecewise functions are where you might have a jump, where we've really just talked about holes in the last few examples. Let's think about this. 
uh, as X approaches two from the left. Hmm, okay. Well, if you think about the two pieces of the function, which one of these would represent the left side of two? Well, the left side of two, our number is a little bit smaller than two, right? So that would be X is less than two. So turns out all we're gonna have to do is correctly identify which piece we need and then plug the two right in. Use the piece to the left of X equals two. So that's the X plus one where X is less than two. Um, so we can say, okay, well, to answer this, I'll take the limit as X approaches two from the left of X plus one. That's simply a matter of plugging it in. And I get the answer three. There you go. How about the limit as X approaches two from the right? Well, similar, use the piece that represents numbers a little bit larger than two. That's when X is greater than two. So we'll use that piece right there. And here it all is. Uh, that would equal the limit as X approaches two from the right square root of X. Oh, that's got X plus two, where this has X minus two. I think I meant to say X minus two up here. My mistake, I will correct that. Um, but okay, we'll go with X minus two at this point. So we plug the two in and we get the square root of zero, which equals zero. <laughs> okay, finally, these were both one-sided limits. Now we've got a two-sided limit. Hey, what would be the answer to the two-sided limit? Just X approaches two. And say, well, hmm. I mean, I don't have a graph, but I can see that the left side went to three and the right side went to zero. They're not going to the same place. So the two-sided limit does not exist. There was a jump there. It was going towards a three and then it jumped down to zero and then continued on. So that's a DNE. For this two-sided limit, the left and right limits must be equal. If these numbers were the same, then we'd have an answer here and it would be that number again, but they're not. So there you go. Um, I'm going to, let's check out the graph. Clicking, clicking, oh boy. There we go. All right, here's how to graph a piecewise function. Okay, so there we see y equals x plus one. We can graph y equals square root. You type in sqrt and let's graph square root x minus two, what I meant to say the whole time. How do we do that piecewise? If you go, let's say up here, if you space, and then I believe you just use, maybe it's curly brackets. There we go. X less than two. You just put in um, its domain in curly brackets. And for the other one, X for a greater than or equal to, you can use these little symbols down here. The greater than, there you go. And so it's only graphing it on its domain. There we've got the two pieces, the X plus one, it's headed towards three, notice. And here, if we come back from the right, it's headed towards zero. I wonder if it will give me a hole at the very end. Yeah, we got, undefined there at two, but on this side, it is there since it's or equals at zero. Pretty slick. Okay, back to the lecture. Uh, let's move on to infinite limits. Infinite limits are where the answer to your limit, the Y value, might be infinity or negative infinity. So let's take a look here um, at this 
graph I made. This graph has a vertical asymptote at x equals two. So what might we say about the limit for this function as x approaches two? Say, hmm, well, on the left side, it's going up and up and up. On the right side, it's going down, down, down. It's not the same place. So that two-sided limit would be a D and E, does not exist. Okay, 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 sure, sure, sure. That's not all that interesting. We kind of know that already. All right, what about then if X approaches two from the left? Well, from the left, we're not concerned about this other piece, this other uh, arm or branch of this graph, if you will. We're only looking at this first one as from the left side of two and then coming back towards two, it's going up and up and up. So we're gonna say that that equals infinity as X approaches two from the right, looking to the right side and then coming back toward it, that's going to negative infinity. Okay. Obviously things get harder when you don't have a graph. So let's take a look at a couple of these. Um, kind of similar, each one of these, you know, there's be some similarities, right? But there definitely be some differences in how we go about them. So let me switch cameras here. We'll start with X plus one over X minus five, the limit as X approaches five from the right. Let me stop sharing, switch my camera. Okay, example, and again, this is determine the infinite limit. And you notice we're told it's an infinite limit in the question, which is, which is really nice. Okay, so what's going on here and how could we even like identify this one as being different from some of those limit questions we saw before. What would happen if we plug in? Well, let's see, we'd have five plus one over five minus five, six over zero. Now, what's special about that? Notice this is not a whole, right? A whole is always zero over zero, which then we can go further and cancel things out, simplify, then plug in. We don't have zero over zero here. We have six over zero. That means if there's a number, a non-zero number over zero, that means there is a vertical asymptote here at x equals five. Zero over zero is a whole. A number over zero is a vertical asymptote. Well, a vertical asymptote means something's happening with infinity, right, as we approach. The question is, does f of x go to positive infinity or to negative infinity on the right side of five. All right, we're approaching five from the right. We don't care about the left, right? What's, what's happening? Well, if we don't have a graph, which we're assuming, right? There's only one way to do this. We're gonna use a table, right? It's kind of our last resort. Well, that's the way it goes. There we go. We'll look at X up against X plus one over X minus five. Let's see, on the right side of five, number is a little bit bigger than five. A good way to go would be 5.1, 5.01, and 5.001. It's a good progression. We've got three, so we can see how it's changing. I'll just invite you guys to 
plug these in with me. So 5.1 plus one divided by, let's see, is that'd be 6.1 divided by 0 0.1, 61. The next one, let's see, 5.01 plus one, okay. This is 601. And finally, 5.001 plugged in would be 6,001. Well, you know, what's happening? Are we going to positive infinity or negative infinity you know, as, we, as we're kind of moving back towards five? So, you know, if we kind of were to kind of sketch our idea of the graph, there's five. Are we going up this way or are we going down this way? Well, we can see from the y values as we work our way closer back to five, they're getting bigger. So it looks like pretty clear. We're going to positive infinity. So to write our final answer, we can just say infinity. We don't necessarily have to say positive infinity, infinity right there. Again, is this like foolproof? Like, no, because infinitely many things could happen between 5.001 and five, but we really don't have any other choice. So we're gonna go with it. And, you know, we're not gonna try and do anything sneaky to you guys. And I would say use a table here. Part B, this is a cool one. The limit as X approaches pi over two from the left, the natural log of tangent X. Hmm. How are we gonna do that? Um, if you were to attempt to plug in, the tangent of pi over two, turns out that is undefined. You remember the graph of tangent? Um, the graph of tangent has a vertical asymptote. Tangent has a vertical asymptote at x equals pi over two. So here, a little trig knowledge will serve you well. So surely if we can't plug into tangent X, we're not gonna take the natural log of tangent X. That's not gonna, that's not gonna work for us either. Um, well, what are we gonna do? Well, there's no simplifying, right? <laughs> we, but we do know there's a vertical asymptote. So our answer is either positive infinity or negative infinity. Um, so, you know, we're just gonna, Create a table <laughs> and see what happens. Uh, let's see, x and the natural log of tangent x. Now, what are we gonna do with our table? This one is a little bit more to it because we're talking about pi over two. Um, what is pi over two like as a decimal? All right. So I put that in my calculator. About 1.5707976327. And of course, there are more decimals than that. Um, we're just going to have to take values, you know, we're approaching from the left side a little bit smaller. And, you know, we're, it's not quite this going to be necessarily the same pattern, um, but that's okay. Here's what we can do. Say, okay, if this is pi over two and I want to take numbers a little bit less, why don't I just take the first few decimal points, 1.57? That's a little bit less than the actual pi over two. And then as I keep going, why don't I add a couple more decimal places? How about 1.5707 and 1.5779? One now, here, you know, the zero. I could have, I guess, just taken the next decimal place, but the zero, um, it would have been the same number. So I added the seven as well. 
And then the next one, well, we can just you know put the nine on. We'll see what happens. You know, kind of add one more decimal place. Unless we have a zero, then we got to go one more. So let's see here. The natural log of tangent 1.57. Make sure in radians. I got 7.13. Five, five. Let's go to six places. Zero, zero. Well, okay, I'll round it to zero, seven. Okay. Let's try this for the next one. 1.5707. Oh, seven. Mm hmm. 9.24764. Seven, seven, Got a little bit bigger, not too much. Hmm, let's see. Let's see what I'm doing here. Uh, the natural log of tangent 1.57079. Getting a little bit bigger. 11.9707. We'll say 17. Here's the thing the natural log is really dampening how big these numbers get. If we were to put them just into tangent, we'd get probably very large numbers. But the natural log is shrinking those. So it's still increasing, but just very slowly. We can recognize that, you know, and we can say, okay, yes, uh, those numbers are getting smaller, but they are still getting bigger. And so we know that this limit is also. slowly, but it is going towards positive infinity based on our table. Kind of curious to what the graph of that looks like. Let's try it out. Y equals the natural log tangent x. And I'm going to graph x equals pi over two for pi, type in pi, and yep, there it is. So the red is our function, the blue is the vertical asymptote, and yep, surely enough, that is shooting up to positive infinity from the left side. The right side, looks like there are, might be some numbers not in the domain I'm not really sure what's going on on the right side, but on the left side, it, it's all we're worried about. We are going to positive infinity. Very cool. What is it like without the natural log? No, there's tangent. Okay, and tangent is just getting bigger, much, much bigger, much faster. Uh, but throw that natural log on and the numbers numbers shrink quite a bit. All right, I like it. We've got one more. Part C. The limit as x approaches eight, <clears throat> one over x minus eight squared. Let me jump back to the lecture. Did I get that right? Yes. Oh, negative one. Okay, glad I checked. Negative one over x minus eight squared. Say, ah, you know what? If I tried to plug in, what would happen? Negative one over zero. That tells us there's a vertical asymptote at x equals eight. If I get that number over zero, any number that's not zero, vertical asymptote, wherever it's approaching. Mm, okay. So we got to use a table. There's no simplifying, right? All right, x here. Oh, notice. Oh, wow. We got to point this out. This is a two sided limit. We have to do it for both sides. And in order for there to be an answer, we're going to have to get the same thing 
Oh, wow. Mm, let's see here. Okay. Um, from the left side of eight, so that would be like 7.9, 7.99, 7.999. On the right side of eight, 8.1, and then coming back. Okay. okay, it's just a matter of plugging in. Let's see here, negative one over 7.9 minus eight quantity squared, negative 100, or 7.99. Negative 10,000, okay. 7.999, plugging in. Negative 1 million. Let me count those zeros again. One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. Negative a million. Okay, seems to be going to negative infinity. Let's check this side. Negative 100, ah, okay. Negative 10,000, yep. Negative 1 million. Got that symmetrical. Won't always be symmetrical, but it's not unusual either. Um, so this side's going to negative infinity. This side is also going to negative infinity. That tells us that our answer, they are equal, we're going to negative infinity. Um, let's take a look just really quick at the graph. I always recommend checking out graphs, just helps it develop your intuition. Um, and you're seeing the problem done from multiple angles. Oh yeah, look at that vertical asymptote at eight and both sides are headed toward negative infinity. And even though there's that gap in the middle, um, they're still squeezing you know, together. Uh, and so both the left side and the right side are headed to the same place. And so we have, do have a, an answer here of negative infinity. Very nice, very nice. All right, you guys, let's stop this video here. We've got one more idea to talk about next.